Paul was a trained ski racer and hot shot on the slopes. One day he was hot dogging down the moguls and noticed, while in midair, that he was going to crash into someone on the front of the It was too late to do anything about it. Hall had gone ballistic, and I don't mean figuratively. Hall was prosecuted for manslaughter. The state of Colorado had adopted the model penal code definition of involuntary manslaughter. So we have an opportunity to study how it is supposed to work. The model penal code defines two ways in which manslaughter is committed. We have already examined the second way, the model penal code version of voluntary manslaughter. But Hall is prosecuted for what the court calls reckless manslaughter. Reckless manslaughter is what is meant by the term involuntary manslaughter. The Wolanski court defined involuntary manslaughter in terms of wanton or reckless conduct. The model penal code leaves out the wanton. We can assume that wanton is simply another way of saying reckless, and so it is redundant. You might wonder why the model penal code equates these two quite different kinds of homicide and classifies both as manslaughter one voluntary, the other involuntary, carrying the same range of punishment upon conviction. Why invite a jury to punish someone like Hall for the same crime as someone who intentionally killed? The answer, I suspect, is that the drafters of the Model Penal Code thought it better to leave well enough alone. The states were familiar with the two varieties of manslaughter that had been handed down by tradition, and I suspect that the drafters thought there were other reforms that were more pressing. The sentencing authority had to be trusted to take the differences into account anyway, and so the two traditional types of manslaughter were preserved. The model penal code defines recklessness this way. A person acts recklessly when he consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that is a gross deviation from the standard of conduct that a law-abiding person would observe in the actor's situation. The trial court dismissed the prosecution because it read substantial risk to mean greater than 50 percent. The trial court did not believe a reasonable jury could find beyond a reasonable doubt that it was likelier than not that Hall would crash into another skier. And so it dismissed. The prosecution appealed. Double jeopardy does not kick in until a case has gone to the jury. The state Supreme Court reinstated the charge. It held that a substantial risk need not be a likelier than not chance of an injury to another. What is a substantial risk? In commentary, the model penal code explains substantial and unjustifiable are terms of degree. Indeed, they are matters of degree. Both substantial and justifiable are also value concepts. Therefore, the commentary continues, some standard is needed for determining how substantial and how unjustifiable the risk must be. Well, what is that standard? Let's have it. The commentary candidly confesses that there is no way to state this value judgment that does not beg the question in the last analysis. So there is no way of expressing these concepts more precisely. The jury must evaluate the actor's conduct and determine whether it should be condemned. This does not mean that the trial judge would never be justified in dismissing a charge of manslaughter. What it means is that the trial judge's task is to evaluate whether a reasonable jury could conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused had taken a substantial and unjustifiable risk. The Supreme Court of Colorado concludes that a reasonable jury could so find. 
So Hall and the Model Penal Code locate involuntary manslaughter in the upper left slot in this matrix. The Model Penal Code also emphasizes that the prosecution must persuade the fact finder that the accused was consciously aware of his taking the risk which, when taken, caused another to die. This raises a question. Suppose the defendant was aware of the risk of skiing out of control, as indeed Hall would have been, must the prosecution also prove that the defendant was aware the risk was substantial? Hall was a trained ski racer who may have overestimated his abilities. Should he be acquitted on that ground? And suppose the defendant thinks his risk-taking is justifiable. Does that negate an element of the prosecution's case? The only sensible interpretation is that culpability needn't be shown as to substantiality and unjustifiability. All the prosecution needs show is that the defendant was aware of the risk his conduct created. It is for the court and jury to decide whether or not that risk was substantial and unjustifiable.